Wednesday, September 28th, Hurricane Ian makes landfall in southwest Florida as one of the most powerful storms ever recorded in the United States, fueled by global warming. Please do not be outside during this storm. If you're in those southwest Florida counties, uh, you need to be sheltering uh, in place. So even if you're not in the direct path of the storm, you need to take all tornado warnings seriously. Florida Governor DeSantis ordered about two and a half million people to evacuate southwest Florida before the storm hit. A day after a so-called referendum in Russian-occupied territories in Ukraine, officials in Washington, D.C. are talking war crimes, sanctions, and announcing new military aid to Ukraine. Let's be clear. The results are completely fabricated and do not reflect the will of the people of Ukraine. But no matter what President Putin and his enablers try to claim, these areas are and will remain part of Ukraine. The U.S. is to provide an additional $1.1 billion in aid to Ukraine, with funding for about 18 more advanced rocket systems and other weapons to counter drones that Russia has been using against Ukrainian troops. Meanwhile, long lines of Russians trying to escape being called up to fight in Ukraine continue to clog highways out of the country today. Moscow reportedly sets up draft offices at borders to intercept some of them. A surprise from California Governor Gavin Newsom as he signs one of the most contentious bills before him this year, reversing course on a measure to help farm workers unionize after President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris support it. And evidentiary hearings underway in a Washington, D.C. courtroom this week to decide if a massive class action lawsuit against the cell phone industry will be allowed to go to trial. Plaintiffs say cell phones cause brain tumors. From Pacifica Radio, KBFA Berkeley, KBFK, Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Hurricane Ian made landfall in southwest Florida today as one of the most powerful storms ever recorded in the United States, fueled by climate change. Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis said there will be major, major impacts from the Category 4 hurricane. Winds of 155 miles per hour, and that is just shy of a Category 5 hurricane. 155 mile an hour winds are incredibly dangerous. Hurricane Ian has now been downgraded to a Category 3 storm. Ian strengthened rapidly overnight. The hurricane's center struck near Cayo Costa, a protected barrier island just west of heavily populated Fort Myers. That's about 100 miles south of Tampa and St. Petersburg, where initial reports had predicted the storm would come ashore. Officials warned residents that Tampa could still experience powerful winds and up to 20 inches of rain. About 2.5 million people were ordered to evacuate southwest Florida before the storm hit, swamping city streets with water and smashing trees along the coast. But not all did. There were no initial reports of deaths or injuries. One official said there had been hundreds of calls for help, some by people threatened by rising waters inside their homes. The massive storm was expected to trigger flooding across a wide area of Florida as it crawls northeastward. Governor DeSantis said there were more than 1.1 million power outages and warned it will take time to get the electricity flowing again. When you have a storm coming in at 155 miles an hour, uh, that's not just going to knock down a few power lines. Yeah, it's, it's going to do that. Uh, but it also has the potential uh, to really uproot a lot of the infrastructure. And so as you get more severe wind impacts, uh, more powerful storm, the storm surge, you know, that's where you're in jeopardy of seeing a lot of that infrastructure disrupted. 
The federal government sent 300 ambulances with medical teams and was ready to truck in 3.7 million meals and 3.5 million liters of water once the storm passes. President Biden promised federal support. The storm is incredibly dangerous, to state the obvious. It's life-threatening. The federal government's going to be there to help you recover. We'll be there to help you clean up and rebuild. Flash floods were possible across all of the state. Hazards include the polluted leftovers of Florida's phosphate fertilizer mining industry. More than one, million, uh, one billion tons of hot, slightly radioactive waste is stored in enormous ponds that could overflow in the heavy rains. Speaking on Democracy Now! this morning, WMNF Tampa Radio News Director Sean Canaan said it's Important to remember the role climate change plays in supercharging hurricanes like Ian. Climate change has made the waters warmer, and that causes storms to be stronger. Climate change has made more atmospheric moisture, which is, that's one of the reasons why there's going to be 24 inches of rain in Orlando this week. And it, also, climate change has made the seas higher, and they're, they're, keep, they're going to be, keep getting higher. And what that does is that increases the damage from storm surge. If you have a 10-foot 10, 10 storm surge over today's level of, of, climate, of, of sea level, that is, well, that's certainly different than what would have been if, it, if, the foot, if the seas were one foot lower. So all of these things are very much impacted by climate dis- disruption. Parts of Georgia and South Carolina also could see flooding rains and some coastal surge into Saturday. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp preemptively declared an emergency, ordering 500 National Guard troops into standby. Cuban officials say they've begun to restore some power after Hurricane Ian knocked out electricity to the entire island. The storm that hit with Category 3 force winds also devastated some of Cuba's most important tobacco farms when it hit the island's western tip and killed at least two people. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has been working with Native American tribes in the southeast in preparation for the onslaught of Hurricane Ian. Antonia Gonzalez has that story. Lars Krutak is FEMA's National Tribal Advisor at the National Response Coordination Center. He says they're in close contact with the Seminole Tribe, the Miccosukee Tribe, and the Porch Band of Creek Indians in Alabama. We continue to message that all tribal members ensure they have an emergency plan in place and to check in on neighbors to see if they need assistance. People with access and functional needs, including older adults, may need extra assistance to prepare for the storm. For people with disabilities and their families, it is important to consider their circumstances and their special needs to effectively prepare. FEMA has supplies and personnel ready in different locations in Florida and Alabama to get help where it's needed as soon as possible, including with water, meals, and cots. The agency is encouraging people in evacuation zones to have a plan for their families and pets and be ready to evacuate. FEMA's tribal coordination includes working with the Interior Department, the Indian Health Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the American Red Cross. As of Wednesday morning, the National Weather Service warning showed Hurricane Ian was approaching the west coast of Florida. The life-threatening storm is likely to have devastating wind damage, flooding, and tornadoes are possible in central and south Florida. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. President Joe Biden has approved a billion-dollar military aid package for Ukraine. The package comes a day after Russian-backed leaders in Russian-occupied territories in Ukraine held so-called referendums on joining the Russian Federation. The referendums are widely viewed as fraudulent and illegal efforts to aid the faltering Russian invasion. Christopher Martinez reports. A day after results were announced in a sham referendum in Russian-occupied territories of Ukraine, officials in Washington, D.C. are talking war crimes, sanctions, and announcing new military aid to Ukraine. And today, the United States is announcing an additional $1.1 billion package of weapons and equipment for Ukraine through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. This includes 18 new high-mobility artillery rocket system and also known as HIMARS, which Ukraine has used so effect- effectively on the battlefield. It is also includes 
hundreds of armored vehicles, radars, and counter drone systems. Besides the HIMARS rocket systems and ammunition, the new aid includes 150 Humvees, tactical vehicles to tow artillery and carry heavy equipment, drones, body armor, and more. It's all, at least in part, a response to the sham referenda on independence held in the Russian-occupied areas of Donetsk, Luhansk, Saporizhia, and Kherson. People in those regions of Ukraine were reportedly bused to polling stations to cast their ballots under the watching eyes of armed soldiers. Not surprisingly, the announced results were as much as 99% in favor of joining the Russian Federation. Ned Price is a spokesperson for the U.S. State Department. These results were concocted in Moscow, not collected in Ukraine. Let's be clear. The results are completely fabricated and do not reflect the will of the people of Ukraine. This is the will of Moscow, not the free will of Ukraine or its people. Price says the Kremlin's next step will likely be for Russia to try to annex Ukrainian territory, an act that would violate international law. But no matter what President Putin and his enablers try to claim, these areas are and will remain part of Ukraine. Ukraine has every right to continue to defend its sovereignty and its territorial integrity. The United States will never recognize Russia's attempts to annex parts of Ukraine. Elsewhere in Washington, Ukraine was a topic in the halls of Congress. Some officials referred to the apparent sabotage bombing of the Nord Stream pipeline that ships Russian gas to Germany. One Senate committee held hearings on sanctions against Russia. Another, the Senate Rules Committee, met on gaps in federal war crimes prosecutions. And the subject of Ukraine came up there. Eli Rosenbaum is Director of Human Rights Enforcement and Strategy at the U.S. Justice Department. A message that uh, a number of us have tried to send uh, to the Russian side, so to speak, is if you are daring to consider obeying a criminal order, uh, you should worry that there might be an American uh, in your uh, line of sight. Uh, and that could be, uh, 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 that would include a dual citizen, because then we may have jurisdiction and we have a long memory here in the United States. In Ukraine, the new military aid package comes as welcome news. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky tweeted Wednesday that defense aid must be enhanced in response to Russian sham referenda. The U.S. is proposing a U.N. Security Council resolution condemning the referenda and blasting any Russian annexation of Ukrainian territories. The State Department's price says you can expect additional measures from the U.S. in the coming days. And at the White House, Jean-Pierre says the U.S. will be imposing more costs on Russia and continuing to stand with Ukraine. We will not be deterred from supporting Ukraine. We will continue to stand with the Ukrainian people and provide them with the security assistance they need to defend themselves for as long as it takes. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. European companies are ramping up security around pipelines and energy prices are climbing again as the suspected sabotage of two Nord Stream pipelines that deliver natural gas from Russia underscored the vulnerability of Europe's energy infrastructure and prompted the EU to warn of possible retaliation. Seismologists say explosions rattled the Baltic Sea before unusual leaks were discovered yesterday on the two underwater pipelines running from Russia to Germany. A Danish official said the Nord Stream gas leaks in the Baltic Sea could emit the equivalent of one-third of Denmark's total annual greenhouse gas emissions. That would also be five times the amount of the potent greenhouse gas as was emitted during the Aliso Canyon well disaster in Southern California between 2015 and 2016. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Stanford University climate scientist Rob Jackson said whoever ordered this should be prosecuted for war crimes and go to jail. Some European officials and energy experts have said Russia is likely to blame for any sabotage since it directly benefits from higher energy prices and economic anxiety across Europe although others cautioned against pointing fingers and still invest until investigators are able to determine what happened. 
Russia has sharply curtailed natural gas shipments to Europe in retaliation for European and American sanctions that the West put in place after its invasion of Ukraine. Today, the Russian energy giant Gazprom increased its pressure on Europe, threatening on Twitter to cease dealing with a Ukrainian company that controls one of the two remaining pipelines that ship Russian gas to Europe. In Moscow, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said allegations that Russia would have sabotaged its own pipelines were predictable and stupid. Reporter Stuart Smith in Moscow. Any allegation that Russia is involved doesn't make sense because it is something that only makes the situation worse for Russia, that these were two routes by which Russia wanted to be exporting gas, either they, even though neither of them right now were running. But Russia throughout has insisted that's not due to its politics, but the politics of the European Union. Stuart Smith, Moscow. Long lines of Russians trying to escape being called up to fight in Ukraine continued to clog highways out of the country today. And Moscow reportedly set up draft offices at borders to intercept some of them. North Ossetia, a Russian region that borders Georgia, declared a state of high alert and said that food, water, warming stations and other aid should be brought in for those who have spent days in lines. Volunteers on the Georgian side of the border also have brought water, blankets, and other assistance. North Ossetia restricted many passenger cars from entering its territory and set up a draft office at 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 least one border crossing. Some media outlets have released photos at the crossing showing a black van with military enlistment office written on it. Protesters carrying Georgia and Ukrainian flags and signs like Russia kills greeted Russians at the Georgia border today. Tens of thousands of Russian men have fled in the week since President Putin announced a mobilization to bolster struggling Russian forces in Ukraine. Although Putin said the call-up was partial, aimed at calling up about 300,000 men with past military service, Many Russians fear it will be much broader and more arbitrary than that. And there are numerous reports of men with no military training and of all ages receiving draft notices. Russians have been leaving by car, bicycle, scooter, and on foot. Georgia's interior ministry said over 53,000 Russians had entered the country since last week. There are also long lines at the border with Kazakhstan, which has taken in more than 98,000 Russians in the past week. Russia has land borders with some 14 countries. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has just released its estimated cost of the canceling of $10,000 worth of student debt for those who make less than $125,000 a year or households making less than $250,000. Pell Grant recipients get another $10,000 in debt relief. Mary Sherman reports. The Congressional Budget Office is putting a $400 billion price tag on the Biden administration's federal student loan forgiveness plan. It would forgive $10,000 for borrowers earning up to $125,000 and $20,000 for Pell Grant recipients. Conservative groups call it a handout and are considering legal action, but Democratic Congresswoman Ayanna Pressley argues it will change and save lives. I get emotional thinking about the profound impact this will have for our families, especially families that have been systematically denied the opportunity to own or build generational wealth. An estimated 43 million borrowers share about $1.6 trillion in student debt. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. For the first time in a decade, Medicare recipients will pay less next year on monthly premiums for the Part B plan, which covers routine doctor's visits and other outpatient care. The 3% decrease in monthly premiums comes as another change is looming, lowering insulin costs. Catherine Carley has the story. 
President Joe Biden said Americans will soon pay less in monthly premiums for the Medicare Part B and no more than $35 for a one-month supply of insulin. Many of us have been trying to fix this problem, but for years, Big Pharma has stood in the way. To, not this year. This year, the American people won and Big Pharma lost. Biden said lower costs are the result of the Inflation Reduction Act, which Congress passed last month. The rare 3 percent decrease in monthly premiums will kick in next year, bringing the average to about $165 per month. For Public News Service, I'm Catherine Carley. Federal public health officials say early studies show at-risk people who receive just one dose of the monkeypox vaccine have appeared to be significantly less likely to get sick from the virus, although they're still urging a second dose to get full protection. Eileen Alfandari reports. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Rochelle Walensky offered the first look into how well the Genios vaccine is working against the outbreak of monkeypox. Early findings and similar results from studies in other countries suggest that even one dose of the monkeypox vaccine offers at least some initial protection against infection. As some cities and counties tried to stretch the limited supply this summer, they stopped offering the recommended second dose of the shot. Now public health officials are trying to catch up, reminding people to get their second dose. Walensky also urged people to get the second dose for full protection 28 days after the first shot. We know from laboratory studies that immune protection is highest two weeks after the second dose of vaccine. And it is for that reason that we continue, even in light of these promising data, to strongly recommend people receive two doses of Genios vaccine. About 150,000 second doses had been administered as of September 17th, according to the CDC. The CDC's new figures show that unvaccinated men between the ages of 18 and 49 who were considered eligible for the vaccine were 14 times as likely to become infected as those who had one dose at least two weeks earlier. White House National Monkeypox response coordinator Bob Fenton said roughly 800,000 first and second doses of the vaccine have been administered across the country to people considered at high risk for becoming infected, primarily men who have sex with men. As of today, we have administered over 800,000 shots in arms. That's tremendous progress from where we were just a few weeks ago. This progress is a result of our comprehensive effort to get shots in arms, bring vaccines directly to the impacted, and work closely with groups and communities and health departments to help reduce risk behaviors. But let me be clear, we are not done with this fight. There's still a lot of work to do. We must continue to reach more of the highest risk communities, especially black and brown communities. The number of new monkeypox cases has declined in recent weeks, but there are signs of worsening racial disparities, with black people making up roughly 47% of new cases reported the week of September 11th. I'm Eileen Alfandari for KPFA Pacifica Radio. Tonight, as part of the evening news, I would like to invite you who are listening tonight to become a sponsor of this radio station. Now, you know we don't have commercials, so we don't have commercial sponsorship, but we do have listener sponsorship. In fact, that's the only kind of sponsorship we've got. In fact, listener sponsorship is really about all the money we've got and are likely to get. We invented listener sponsorship. We were the first radio station to do it. And you can blame us for all those pledge drives you hear on public radio or see on public television. Yeah, that was our idea more than 70 years ago. <clears throat> But however, it has been uh, co-opted by maybe uh, institutions that have other sources of funding and really don't need listener sponsorship. It's not a bad idea that you, the listener, pay us, the broadcasters, for providing the radio signal 
with the programs that um, you like, enjoy, learn something from, think are valuable to yourself, to your family, to your community, to the body politic as a whole, whatever. It allows us to <clears throat> be independent of the capitalist marketplace and to exercise our artistic and editorial independence and freedom, freedom of speech, to try to bring to you ideas and forms of art and forms of music and forms of culture that are not viable in the normal American capitalistic marketplace. So that's the idea behind it. We may not always live up to the idea, <clears throat> but it's the best thing we've been able to figure out so far. So we're going to ask, <clears throat> I'm going to invite 20 of you tonight who are listening to the newscast to become listener sponsors. And the way you do it is you call us at 1-800-439-5732 or you go online at kpfa.org. Except if you're listening in Southern California, there's a different phone number. If you're listening to KPFK in Los Angeles, you call 818-985-5735 or go online at kpfk.org. That is another, another number again in Southern California, 818-985-5735, kpfk.org. I'm looking for you, <clears throat> for 20 of you tonight to make that call, to make a donation, to make a contribution, to become a listener sponsor. If you can do it on a sustaining basis and pledge a certain amount each month tied to your bank account or your credit card, that would be great. 1-800-439-5732. I must confess that I have tried to get 20 of you in previous fundraising efforts in this fund drive to make a call, to make a donation, <clears throat> and I haven't been able to do it. I have fallen short. So I would like to get that 20 tonight, if you don't mind, if you don't mind giving us a call at 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. As always, I'm laboring under the obligation to keep bringing you as much news as I can, and hopefully you understand that I can only bring you the news because we have enough listener sponsors, and I need 20 of you tonight, and so that you will call us while I bring you the rest of the news, or you go online at kpfa.org, or you make that call at 1-800-439-5732. California Governor Gavin Newsom joined about two dozen jubilant, cheering farm workers camped outside the state capitol today to sign one of the most contentious bills before him this year, reversing course on a measure to help farm workers unionize after President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris supported it publicly. The White House support put Newsom in a difficult political position after his office had announced before Democratic lawmakers had sent him the bill that he would not sign it. But Newsom said he approved the bill after he, the United Farm Workers Union, and the California Labor Federation agreed on clarifying language to be considered during next year's legislative session to address his concerns around implementation and voting integrity. Newsom's office said the agreement includes a cap on the number of unionization petitions over the next five years and will allow state regulators to better protect worker confidentiality and safety. C.C. Puede, the farm workers chanted as Newsom signed the bill, echoing the United Farm Workers' longtime slogan, roughly, Yes, We Can, in Spanish. Newsom said in a statement after signing the bill that California's farm workers are the lifeblood of the state and have the fundamental right to unionize and advocate for themselves in the workplace. The new law will allow farm workers to vote by mail in union elections as an alternative to physical locations. Proponents say that would help protect workers from union busting and other intimidation. Owners say such a system lacks necessary safeguards to prevent fraud. 
Newsom had vetoed similar legislation last year, as had his two most recent predecessors. California Governor Newsom also signed two bills to tackle California's housing crisis. They fast-tracked the construction of new affordable housing in underused areas reserved for office, retail, or for parking. The bills, AB 2011 by Oakland Democrat Buffy Wicks and SB 6, backed by San Francisco Democrat Scott Weiner, exempt certain affordable and mixed-income housing projects from CEQA, the state's Environmental Quality Act, and allows the fast-track development on lands zoned for commercial and parking use. Newsom made the announcement today in San Francisco on a lot slated for an affordable housing development. This is a big deal today. I, I do not want anyone to believe or even to suggest this isn't a breakthrough in housing in this state. These bills matter. They go across the spectrum, not just what we've talked about, but it goes to issues of ADUs, goes to the issue of farm worker housing, goes to the issue, Ben, thank you, of transparency and accountability. Union leaders say the legislation will create thousands of high-paying construction jobs. Newsom says they're part of 38 bills he signed to address the state's housing crisis. He has some 400 more bills to sign or to veto before the legislative calendar ends on Friday night. Homeless people and their advocates have sued the city of San Francisco in federal court to stop police sweeps without offering them housing. The lawsuit was filed on behalf of the Coalition on Homelessness and says the practice of forcing people to living on the streets to clear out without offering shelter violates the law. The lawsuit would also stop the city from seizing the property of homeless people. The lawsuit says San Francisco has not built enough affordable housing. Advocates for the homeless want the city to spend at least $4 billion on affordable homes. The offices of Mayor London Breed and, city, and the city attorney declined to comment, but said San Francisco is focused on expanding housing and shelter. The city of Mountain View has settled a class action lawsuit to stop a citywide ban on parking RVs and other oversized vehicles often used by homeless people to live in. The lawsuit by six plaintiffs on behalf of all who live in such vehicles, argued the ban was unconstitutional, inhumane, and disproportionately impacted people with disabilities in violation of federal and state law. The settlement includes the city providing three miles of available parking for RVs and other oversized vehicles without any overnight parking restrictions and making maps available detailing those elections. The court settlement still needs to be approved by a judge. In the state of Virginia, evictions on the rise after numerous protections provided by federal and state rental assistance programs have ended. Edwin Vieira reports. According to the Richmond Eviction Lab, the number of renters in Virginia fearing eviction during the first quarter of 2022 was 58%, almost double from the fourth quarter of 2021. Christy Mara with the Virginia Poverty Law Center says a perfect storm of evictions has been brewing for some time now. She says tenants' protections have practically evaporated over the last few months, but identifies an important one remaining. The tenant still has what we call a right of redemption, which simply means they have the right to pay everything they owe the landlord up until 48 hours before the sheriff comes, and they have to stop that eviction. In most cases, there are a few exceptions to that for tenants who rent from small-time mom-and-pop landlords. Numerous landlords have filed eviction cases to be prosecuted over what advocates say are unrealistic periods of time. Mara cites one apartment complex in Chesterfield called Rollingwood that is prosecuting 59 cases in one week. Another has 99 eviction cases that will be prosecuted over a 10-day period. She doesn't want people to think this is about people unable to pay their rent. Rather, she charges that there is a larger issue, with evictions becoming part of a larger corporate landlord's business model. 
Though the numbers are rising, Mara feels elected officials at each level of government can take action to slow it down or stop it entirely. At a local level, she suggests having a right to legal counsel to provide tenants with more equal footing when fighting eviction cases. On a state level, she hopes to see some pandemic-era requirements return. We had, during the pandemic, a requirement that landlords give tenants 14 days to pay late rent between the time they get the notice that, hey, you didn't pay your rent, here's what you owe, here's the rent, here's the late fee, please pay, and the time they can take them to court. Five days is not enough time. More time allows people to get their next paycheck, which Mara feels will help people make late payments quicker. Federally, she feels emergency rental assistance needs to be made available all the time, not just in times of great crisis. I'm Edwin J. Vieira, Virginia News Connection. California Governor Newsom has signed more than a dozen laws aiming to make California an abortion sanctuary state. Several of the new laws clash with restrictions in other states. They would block some out-of-state subpoenas and empower California's insurance commissioner to penalize health insurance companies that divulge information to out-of-state entities. Other states have passed laws allowing people to sue anyone who performs or aids in an abortion. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock. And tonight, as part of the newscast, I've invited 20 of you to become listener sponsors of this listener-sponsored alternative radio station. Thus far, eight of you have responded. Thanks to Juliana in Oakland, Richard in Novato, Tamara in Redondo Beach, Tommy in um, Porter Ranch, Lawrence in San Francisco, Beth in Boulder Creek, California, Judy in Monterey, Jerry in Bodega Bay. Thank you for your contributions. Looking for 12 more of you by the time the newscast ends in 23 minutes. All the money goes to keep this newscast on the air, this radio station on the air. We have no other source of income of any amount, no state or federal grants, no foundation, big foundation behind us, uh, no uh, religious organizations. No rich people standing in the wings, passing out bags of cash. No commercials, nor corporate underwriting. We don't get any corporate underwriting like most public, big public radio stations and public TV stations. Nine out of every $10 comes to us exactly in this manner. We open the microphones and the host, the programmer, the announcer, the news guy, that's me tonight, ask for your financial support for the program that you're listening to at the time. <clears throat> and if it's worth some money, you call us and give us some money. 1-800-439-5732 or online, kpfa.org. If you're listening in Southern California, the number is different. It's 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735 or kpfk.org. Up to nine. We're almost halfway to our goal. We're up to nine. Thanks to Sylvia and Alameda. Thank you for being number nine. Would you please be number 10? Give us a call. 1-800-439-5732 or online, kpfa.org. Evidentiary hearings are underway in a Washington, D.C. courtroom this week to decide if a massive class action lawsuit against the cell phone industry will be allowed to go to trial. Suzanne Potter has the story. Multiple families are suing most of the major wireless companies and their trade association, asking for hundreds of millions in damages, claiming cell phone use causes brain tumors. Plaintiff Monique Solomon Martinazzi's husband, Andy, passed at age 43 from a brain tumor that developed right where he used to hold his cell phone. When cell phones first came out, he got one of the original battery-held Motorola's, and it was held to his ear six to seven hours a day. He was in commercial real estate and we just felt so strongly that that was the reason the brain tumor developed where it did. 
The Industry Trade Association and Motorola did not immediately respond to a request for comment, but they have said their products are safe and comply with all government standards. But the lawsuit claims the FCC standards are outdated and points to a massive government study showing that exposure to cell phone radiation can cause brain and heart tumors in rats. Industry lawyers argued in court that if cell phones caused cancer, we'd be seeing an epidemic of tumors. Plaintiff Ellie Marks, whose husband Alan has had two brain surgeries so far, says the industry and the government are ignoring the evidence. There is a rise in primary brain tumors, especially gliomas, especially in the younger population. These tumors used to only be seen in those over 65. Now we're seeing people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s perishing from this. The families are claiming wrongful death, personal injury, and loss of consortium. Joel Moskowitz, Ph.D., is the director of the Center for Family and Community Health in the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. He says if a U.S. court rules that cell phone use leads to brain cancer, the implications are huge. And it probably would lead to many additional cases being filed by brain cancer victims. It also may force our government to finally take this issue seriously. In related news, a judge in Canada recently ruled that a class action lawsuit can go forward against Apple and Samsung. The plaintiffs claim the phones emit more than the allowable levels of radiation and that the defendants knowingly harmed users. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. New York City is straining to house immigrants coming from the U.S.-Mexico border with hundreds of asylum seekers arriving from Texas daily. Mayor Eric Adams announced last week that massive tents in the parking lot of Orchard Beach in the Bronx will serve as temporary shelters. Mary Sherman reports. New York City Mayor Eric Adams plans to construct hangar-sized tents as temporary shelter for thousands of migrants transported to the city by Republican border state governors. Recent polls suggest voters are split on whether they approve or disapprove of migrants being sent to liberal states and cities. Migration Policy Institute President Andrew Seeley says most migrants coming to the southern border are still from Mexico and Central America. But he says migration from Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua is complicated by U.S. policies favoring refugees from the political and economic crises in those communist nations. You can't actually deport people back, which means if they make it to the U.S.-Mexico border, they are likely almost certain to be able to stay in the United States. The White House is planning to launch a refugee sponsorship program by the end of the year, to enlist private groups and citizens to sponsor and resettle refugees. In fiscal 2021, more than 11,000 refugees were resettled through the traditional resettlement program, short of the White House goal of about 62,000. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The special prosecutor leading Mexico's investigation into the 2014 disappearances of dozens of students has resigned. President Andres Manuel López Obrador said a day after the students' families marched to demand justice for their loved ones. Omar Gomez Trejo was appointed to head the probe into the disappearances of the 43 Ayotzinapa College student teachers in 2019, not long after López Obrador came to power. Gomez Trejo appeared to have gained the trust of the families, but the attorney general's office has come under fire for canceling arrest orders for several suspects without explanation and for sensitive portions of a Truth Commission report being leaked to the press. Lopez Obrador said the special prosecutor was leaving his post because he disagreed with the procedures that were followed. The Miguel Agustin Pro Juarez Human Rights Center, a non-governmental organization representing the students' families, said in a statement that the resignation signaled unjustified interference by superiors in the attorney general's office, including rushed accusations and canceled arrest orders. They expressed confidence in Gomez Trejo and his team's work and called the developments extremely concerning for the pursuit of justice in the case. Carrying photographs of the missing students, relatives, and former classmates marched through Mexico City alongside thousands of supporters to demand answers on Monday, which was the eight-year anniversary of the disappearances. 
I'm disappointed. That's the word as a father because, well, the government was campaigning. They committed to deal with this. And those words are just hot air. We know the government had the political will to do something, but that will has disappeared. My brother disappeared on the 4th of July 2014 in plain daylight outside a secondary school. And all of these people have a relative that has disappeared, a brother, a son. We're here showing our support for the parents of the students. We empathize because we've lived through the same thing. Many of the parents, many of the parents have said they had a glimmer of hope last month when Mexico's former top prosecutor was arrested in relation to the case. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers from City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now!, right here on KPFA. Twelve contributors thus far. I was seeking, I still am seeking, 20 of you listening to the newscast tonight to make a donation and become a listener sponsor of this radio station, of this newscast, of the programming that this Pacifica Alternative Radio Station brings you 24 hours a day, 365 days in the year. 1-800-439-5732 to become the 13th listener sponsor tonight. 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. Unless you're in Southern California, where the number is 818-985-5735. And the website is kpfk.org. That's because you're listening to our sister station, KPFK in Los Angeles, 818-985-5735 or kpfk.org. Thanks to Sandra in um, Bremerton, Washington. Thank you for your financial contribution. Peter in Pengrove and Robert in Forestville. Won't you please join your fellow listeners? Call them colleagues. Call them comrades. Call them fellow citizens. Call us with your contribution and join the fraternal and sorietal group of people who support this radio station, 1-800-439-5732, kpfa.org. President Joe Biden is hosting Pacific Island leaders for a two-day summit as the U.S. looks to counter China's military and economic influence in the region. Pacific Island leaders, meanwhile, see an even more pressing concern, climate change. Secretary of State Antony Blinken kicked off the two-day summit today with a luncheon for the Pacific Island leaders and other senior officials from the region. U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry held a climate roundtable with the leaders. And White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was joining them for a dinner hosted by the U.S. Coast Guard. Biden set to address the leaders at the State Department tomorrow. We'll host them for a dinner at the White House. Leaders are also to meet... House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, U.S. business leaders, the leaders from Fiji, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Palau, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, the Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, the Cook Islands, French Polynesia, and the New Caledonia are attending. Vanuatu and Nauru are sending representatives, Australia, New Zealand, and the Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum sent observers. The first of its kind summit comes as the administration is seeking to demonstrate the U.S. remains committed to being an enduring player in the region. While this high-level gathering is welcomed by the region's leaders as a signal of Biden's commitment to the Pacific, there's also a healthy skepticism about whether the United States will remain engaged for the longer term term in the Pacific Islands. The areas received diminished attention from the U.S. in the aftermath of the Cold War, and China has increasingly filled the vacuum. 
New British Prime Minister Liz Truss came under growing pressure today from opponents and inside her own Conservative Party to reverse announced tax cuts that are fueling a financial crisis in an already struggling economy. The Bank of England stepped in to buy up government bonds in an attempt to stabilize the cost of borrowing after the government said last week that it would slash income tax and scrap a planned corporation tax hike, all while spending billions to cap soaring energy bills for homes and businesses. Last Friday's mini-budget sparked market unease about the level of U.K. government debt sent the pound plunging to record lows against the U.S. dollar. Laura Macon Isherwood has more from London. All eyes have been on the Bank of England after the value of the pound fell to an all-time low against the dollar. Now action is being taken, with the bank announcing it will start buying long-dated UK bonds, warning that if market volatility continues, there's material risk to the UK's financial stability. The move is temporary, but serious. Bank bosses have been to meet the UK Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng for crisis talks as the government seeks to set out the rationale for its economic plans. Laura Megan Isherwood, London. The CEOs of the nation's largest banks had to testify before the Senate amidst rising inflation and corporate profits. Catherine Carley reports. The CEOs of America's largest banks appeared before the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, where Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown detailed their record profits and widespread consumer abuses. With those profits and with the taxpayer support you get, come a responsibility to serve your customers in the larger economy. I think you know you don't always hold up your end of the bargain. Brown noted the bank's promotion of their popular money transfer app, Zelle, and their failure to help customers whose money was stolen in fraudulent transactions. Brown said he expects banks to eliminate overdraft and other fees, much like the Federal Reserve waived overdraft fees for banks during the COVID pandemic. For Public News Service, I'm Catherine Carley. And we're two-thirds of the way to our goal. Thanks to Evelyn in El Cerrito and Lori in Berkeley. We're up to 14 donors, 14 listener sponsors. The goal was 20. We've got seven minutes left to try to get six more of you to take the plunge, to check your couch, see what changes there. Grab your mother's credit card. Throw caution to the wind. Take out a second mortgage on your house. Give us a call, 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. This is Serious Business. We're in the middle of the uh, second week of a three-week-long fund drive here at KPFA to see if we can raise enough money. And it always is. We'll see if we can raise enough money. We'll see if we can raise enough money to keep the radio station on the air and to keep all its programming that you're listening to right now on the air. And it is a slog to get to that $475,000 goal. We're in the middle of it. That's what we're trying to do now. Creep a little closer. 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. One person calling right now. Please join them, 1-800-439-5732-KPFA.org. Palestinian Health Ministry reports that at least four Palestinians were killed, 44 wounded, during an Israeli military raid today into the Janine refugee camp in the occupied West Bank, marking the deadliest episode since Israel escalated a crackdown on the occupied territory earlier this year. Israeli forces said they fatally shot two Palestinians they had been sent to arrest in the camp over their suspected involvement in recent shooting attacks. The military said when soldiers surrounded a house in the camp, a bomb exploded, a gunfight ensued, and Israeli troops killed the two Palestinians. During the raid, armed clashes broke out in the camp as militants hurled rocks and opened fire at arriving troops. The Palestinian health ministry said two Palestinians were killed in that fighting and at least 44 others were wounded. Amateur video showed one of the men being shot in the head 
as he appeared to be aiming a weapon at Israeli troops. Israel's been conducting nightly raids in the northern West Bank since a series of deadly Palestinian attacks in Israel last spring. Much of that activity has been focused in the Janine area, where some of the attackers had lived. Israel identified one of the Palestinians killed in today's raid as Rahman Hazam, the brother of a Palestinian resistance fighter who carried out a deadly shooting attack in central Tel Aviv last April before he was killed by police. Still stuck at 14? I don't know if we're going to get to that 20. Please get us off the... uh, Get us off the nudge here. We're stuck here. 1-800-439-5732-KPFA.org. A totem pole from the Lummi Nation in northwest Washington is traveling across the United States to call for clean energy and environmental justice. Eric Tegatoff reports. The pole left the Lummi Reservation in mid-September and has made stops along the way, including in Seattle, George Floyd Plaza in Minneapolis, and in Pittsburgh, which hosted a ministerial meeting on clean energy last week. Douglas James is with Lummi Nation's House of Tears Carvers, which crafted the 14-foot totem pole and is traveling with it across the country. We're um, just standing up for those that don't have a voice, like the birds, the frogs, the salmon, the orcas. The totem pole is scheduled to reach Washington, D.C. this week. James says the Lummi Nation first dedicated a totem pole to victims of September 11th, two decades ago. Wes Gillingham with Catskill Mountain Keeper in New York is traveling with the totem pole as well. He's critical of some alternative fuel sources being proposed, such as what's known as green hydrogen, which has a reduced carbon footprint but still produces emissions. He says indigenous people should be at the forefront in the transition to clean energy. Listen to the voices of indigenous leaders and communities that have been impacted historically. They are working on finding some of their own solutions, organic or sustainable agriculture, to help reduce the emissions from the agricultural industry and industrialization of agriculture that's taken place over the last 50 years. James believes it will take a monumental effort to beat climate change and ensure clean air and water for the next generation. It's going to take every one of us, everybody that's living and breathing upon this planet, to try and do the best that we can to stand and uh, make a difference. For Washington News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. Officials say at least six people were wounded in a shooting at a school in Oakland this afternoon. According to Oakland Fire Department spokesperson Michael Hunt, Paramedics transported six patients to hospitals, all with gunshot wounds. Oakland Mayor Libby Schaaf tweeted that all of the wounded were adults, and the shooting happened at Sojourner Truth Independent Study, an alternative K-12 school that's located on the same block as three other schools. Officials said three of the wounded were in critical condition at Highland Hospital in Oakland. The other three were taken to Eden Medical Center in Castro Valley, Their conditions were not known. A shooting in East Oakland yesterday morning left one man dead and another wounded. That homicide was the 96th this year in Oakland. That compares to 102 last year by the same date. The shootings came after a particularly violent week in Oakland in which eight people lost their lives in separate shootings, including a shooting on Interstate Highway 580 and an attempted robbery of a Brinks armored truck that ended in a deadly exchange of gunfire. We are close. 17 donors, 17 contributors, 17 listener sponsors, one person on the line. If we had two more join At 1-800-439-5732, we'd make our 20, or you can do it online real quick, kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732, partly cloudy in the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow, with highs in the low 70s around the Bay, further inland highs in the mid-80s, sunny with a high in the low 90s in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow and sunny in Los Angeles with highs in the upper 80s. Good evening. KPFA is now live streaming news headlines online. Just in case you can't listen to the radio, tune into our Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for news headlines. That's at KPFA 94.1 on Facebook and at KPFA Radio on Twitter and YouTube. Thank you.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you.